welcome. Uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm a PhD student here at the Gund. Um, this is my fourth semester. I work with John Erickson. And today our speaker is Matthew Dubinek. Um, he is a postdoc at Harvard Forest. Um, he got his bachelor's degree in resource conservation from the University of Montana, um, a master's in forest resources from the University of Massachusetts. Um, then he did his PhD in environmental science and resources at Portland State University. And after that, he, he started his, his postdoctoral work at Harvard Forest. Um, prior to his PhD, he was actually, he had a faculty and department chair appointment at Southern Maine Community College. Um, so he has a lot of teaching experience, which from what I've seen shows during his presentations usually. It's nice. Um, so without further ado, here's Matthew Duvenek, and he's going to be talking about measuring and managing resilience under climate change in the ruined Great Lakes forests. Thank you, Edward. I forgot to mention that I grew up in Vermont. <laughs> and I think this is the first time that I've ever uh, Spoken in Vermont, uh, like officially or anything. So I'm excited to be here. As I'm not quite sure, uh, but delighted to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about measuring and managing for resilience and some other things. Um, uh, I'll just jump right in. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my PhD advisor, Rob Scheller, at Portland State, and my mentor at Harvard Forest, Jonathan Thompson, and a, another mentor, Mark White, who works for the Nature Conservancy of Minnesota, who I uh, work for a lot with. They helped me. Um, and my, what I'm going to present is most of the work, most, mostly the work from my dissertation, uh, which was funded by the LCC, the Upper, upper Midwest and the Great Lakes LCC. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I'm doing now, which is more related to Vermont and New England. So the Northern Great Lakes region, not too far from here, um, is kind of a unique spot to the northern part of that. There's these kind of boreal systems, and to the south of that are some of these uh, more temperate species systems. And in the middle, there's the mix of things. And uh, that makes for an exciting place to study forest change under climate change scenarios uh, because it, it kind of falls in this mid-region, this ecotone. Region not unlike uh, Vermont, it's got lots of wildlife habitat, recreation, carbon storage, water quality, timber, etc. cetera. Um, the management history that region was, was cut over very heavily uh, throughout the uh, 1900s and continues today. Um, the region is made up of lots and lots of heavily disturbed landscapes uh, through mostly clear cutting, mostly harvesting. Uh, of course, that's changing some now, but it's still a big part of the the management story of the region. Potential climate change effects include species and functional group changes, productivity declines, habitat loss, decline in resilience, which I'll talk much more about. Um, the question is, can we manage for that? Do we manage for resilience? And then along with that, or before with that, can we measure it? And measuring resilience is something that, and defining resilience is something that we've all had sort of a challenge doing. Um, in terms of management, for example, can we just keep doing what we've been doing? Keep cutting the forest down like we've been cutting them down, and let's see what happens. That's sort of the business as usual scenario. Another thing we might do is we might set up some of those forests in reserves, not cut them, and put them ex expand the existing reserve areas. Um, Another thing we might do is, is change how we're cutting, or change what we're cutting. Change the patch sizes of the, the harvest prescriptions, or extend the rotation periods. And then finally, we might change what we're planting after we harvest, compared to the business as usual. So these four scenarios sort of outline some of the, the 
management scenarios that I incorporated into my sort of experimental design, which we'll, we'll talk more about. Um, some of the specific questions I said is, how might climate change projections affect the northern forest landscapes under the current management, what we're doing now? And then, how might tree species diversity, which is sort of a, a tangent from the resilience stuff, but it's interesting, trust me. Uh, how might tree species diversity relate to forest productivity under climate change? And then back to resilience, how might we measure and manage for resilience under these different alternative scenarios? Um, so what I did is I took these two landscapes, uh, northern Minnesota and northern lower Michigan, um, and these are unique, uh, they're, the two different landscapes are unique in their sort of more, well, of course, one is further north, one is further south, there's a, there's a climate gradient between these two. It's also a management gradient. Minnesota has sort of more active management, more uh, sort of shorter rotation periods, where Michigan less so. There's also these uh, uh, different forest ownership. There's this big, this northern area, uh, this is a Boundary Waters canoe area. Whoops, it's, it's up there somewhere. Okay. Um, so, I took those two landscapes and I threw at them these four different management scenarios. The business as usual management, trying to replicate what we're doing now. Uh, and then the, this expanded reserve scenario, where I took the existing forest reserves and I simulated the expansion of those reserves along river corridors and around this existing uh, Boundary Waters canoe area, for example, up in here. And these are different river corridors, this light blue is this sort of expansion of a forest reserve. And then uh, modified civic culture where we changed the harvest prescriptions. And then this climate suitable planting where we changed what we're planting. We're planting, I, in these simulations, I planted something different than what traditionally has, has uh, been there. And for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on mostly just these three. I'm gonna not talk too much about the modified civic culture, uh, just for simplicity. So, but I do wanna talk a little more about this climate suitable planting story. Um, in that, some of you probably, did, we've talked about, uh, assisted migration or assisted managed relocation. And oftentimes that's about taking a species, whether that's a wildlife species or a plant species, that's in peril, that's in trouble. And we move that species north or to maintain that species to a new zone. Uh, and now that zone is more climate suitable for that species. But there's another approach which is to take a zone which maybe has sort of a lower productivity expected and take a species that, so in other words, we might, instead of maintaining a species that's in peril, we're maintaining a site that might be in peril. And by doing so, we're taking a species and moving it that may, not, may or may not be in peril and moving it into that space. And I think this makes sense in the traditional forestry uh, world because oftentimes that's the goal is to maintain site productivity uh, rather than sort of maintaining a particular species. Uh, so that was more of the approach that I took, this right hand side, uh, where this site, these sites are heavily managed anyway and the goal for those sites is to produce timber, produce biomass, produce wood, where uh, rather than trying to maintain a specific species that might not be expected to do well. So that was the, the goal of developing this particular scenario, which is controversial, which we can talk more about. I was managing, as I was sort of trying to figure out that scenario, this trade-off between what was socially acceptable and what was sort of a proactive management in terms of the experimental design. And so, for example, if you look at this, this is the range map of bitternut hickory. And you see, and then my two landscapes there. So you see that bitternut hickory is just south of those landscapes, especially the Michigan landscape. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna pick that one. It's almost there, just not quite in those landscapes. I'll pick that. Rather than picking a species from way down south. 
in my scenario. So keep that in mind as we talk about this. So I've looked at these different management scenarios on the left against these uh, climate scenarios at the top there. So current climate, and then this uh, low emissions climate scenario and a high emissions climate scenario. So I kind of crossed the management scenarios and the emissions scenarios. And I ran it through this forest simulation model. So I took the climate data and some soils data from those regions, and I ran it through uh, this ecosystem model, PINA2, and a climate envelope model, and produced this maximum growth and uh, species establishment by these different tree species, and put that through this Landis 2 simulation model, ran that for 150 years. And that the Landis 2 simulation model, uh, it simulates seed dispersal, harvesting, fire and wind, it's all these different spatial processes that are happening uh, across the landscape. And then at an individual cell, it's measuring or following, tracking a species age cohort. And in my case, I had two hectare cells. Uh, and so uh, the successional processes, mortality, growth, uh, establishment of a seed is happening uh, at that uh, site level. So, some of the results. Um, again, back to this first question, how might my climate change projections affect northern hardwood forests under business as usual management? And so this is uh, these two different landscapes, Minnesota and Michigan, across these three different climate scenarios. And you can see that the current climate in white and the low emissions climate in green both uh, follow each other pretty well. And that continued increase in biomass has to do with what? Why is it continuing to increase from year 2000 to year 2150? What's going on there? Well, it's actually it's not. It wasn't simulating an increase in CO2. That's a good question. We can talk about that in a moment. Warmer growing conditions? No. Um, no, the warming growing conditions is the red line. That's the high emission scenario. Why is current current climate continuing to increase biomass? Back you to the slowing. You have a slower rate of warming. No. Because you're replanting? Because you're still early in succession? In the yeah, still early in succession. We remember we started out with these landscapes that have been totally harvested the heck out of over the last hundred years. And so these forests are continuing to add biomass. And our projections show that over the next 150 years, that those, those systems are continuing to grow. That's the, that's the, the short story. Under climate change, the, under high emissions climate scenario, we see a, a, a substantial departure from that. We, just, we see a decline in total biomass. Good question. Do those climate change scenarios go out to 2150? No, that's a good question. You caught me. <laughs> uh, they go to uh, year 100. And so I interpolated the, the last 50 years, and I can talk more about how I did that, um, based on the trend variability for the first 100 years. So I don't think I really understand. So you're saying high emissions climate. Aren't we talking, therefore, about a higher rate of temperature change? And that the climate, the uh, plant, the biome is unable to adapt rapidly enough to add biomass because of the rapid change in temperatures? Temperature and precip. And precipitation. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, under that high emission scenario. Yeah. yeah. If you look at uh, even maybe more dramatic, some of the, uh, the species shifts. So this is a looking at that same 150 years, and in this case, just the Minnesota landscape. And we have the current climate versus that high emissions climate scenario. And so we can see, I'm going to shift it forward here. We can see that um, these different forest types changing over time. And so you can see that, that there's more of this red, which is in this case is the northern hardwoods species, versus the spruce fir at the top, which is green. So we see a loss under the high emission scenario, a loss of the spruce fir species and a gain of these northern hardwood species over time. And under current climate, we see actually an expansion of the more late successional spruce fir species under, under climate. Under, uh, the course of the simulation. Again, 
These are simulations. They're not predictions of a particular uh, site or landscape. That they're meant to be explored uh, as as a scenario rather than a, a prediction. Can I ask another question about this? Yeah. So, um, what is driving the turnover in the species? In other words, um, I mean, I could see species not being with green climate for quite a while, and, and if there's no mortality, then you won't see a shift. And it's only after the high mortality event when you start getting a change in composition. Right, because the species that are growing today, are the same trees are still alive. Right, right. Yeah. So you have like disturbance that's driving the, the changes, or? Sure. We have a, in this case, this is the business as usual scenario. So we have uh, a background wind and fire, as well as the timber harvesting. Timber harvesting is, is driving the disturbance. And then the back to your first question about what is driving the, the real change, we have we see a decline. I don't have the data here, but uh, maybe I do. But um, we see a decline in both that species establishment as well as the maximum growth, the, the, the growth potential of the, some boreal species. And this isn't unexpected. This isn't. Uh, lots of others have have sort of shown the same trend. Um, so I was also looking at this, this diversity of, of species under these climate change scenarios. Um, of course, there's lots of value to diversity, aesthetic, moral obligation, human welfare, welfare and then uh, uh, ecosystem services such as productivity and soil formation, nutrient cycling, water quality related to species diversity. And then I was interested in this graph. Uh, which Whitaker and Leroux uh, and others have, have talked about, which is that this is a theoretical concept, that under low diversity, uh, sorry, under low productivity, there will be this positive linear, sometimes linear, relationship between diversity and productivity. But then under a high diversity, we get sort of a negative slope between diversity and productivity. And that, that can be explained by oops, that uh, under high productivity, we have competitive ex exclusion going on, where there's an ability of a single species to dominate. And then under the lower productivity, that you have these complementarity and identity effects, which are increasing this the positive relationship. And others have empirically measured this. Uh, in Quebec, these folks have uh, looked at this relationship and found that uh, these boreal systems uh, we're following more of this positive relationship under lower productivity and the more temperate systems are following a, a less positive relationship between productivity and uh, diversity. So I was interested in looking at, well, what about under climate change? How would these shifts happen? So how might tree species diversity relate to productivity under climate change? And um, so this is the diversity on the x-axis and above ground net primary productivity or just productivity on the y-axis under the Minnesota and Michigan landscapes. And the colored dots refer to the, the soil water capacity. And you can see that under uh, this current climate that the lowest productive sites are, have the lowest soil water holding capacity, a measure of how much uh, water the soils can hold which makes sense. Uh, and you see less of a, a trend in those data. Under the low emissions climate scenario, you see a similar pattern. But then under the high emissions climate scenario, I found a slightly more positive relationship between this uh, relationship between diversity, species, tree species diversity, and productivity over time. And so, if that's the case, then what we may have is that under current climate, uh, we may not have much of a relationship between diversity and productivity, but then under a high emissions future, we may see more of a, more of a strength in the relationship between diversity and productivity. And of course, that has implications for uh, the conservation of diversity uh, in terms of that, that diversity may be more important to us in the future. And of course, with that scenario, there's lots and lots of uncertainty. And we don't know exactly, again, this is not a prediction, we don't know exactly what, where that's going to fall. 
Um, so then the next sort of step that I took was sort of this question about, well, can we change how we manage for climate change? And specifically, what might we, we manage for? Um, we might manage for resistance, or how might those forests persist to the effects of long-term climate change? Versus the resilience. How might forests recover from a disturbance that's interacting with climate change? And for today, I'm going to focus on this, uh, on, I'm sorry, both of these have something to do with the stability of a system. It's resistance and resilience. And today I'm going to focus on resilience. So, Steve Carpenter wrote what I think is a great paper on this concept of resilience. If we're going to talk about resilience, we have to talk about of what and to what. What that means is you can't talk about resilience unless you're defining the system that is being it is resilient, resilient to and then to what disturbance that system is interacting with. So, for example, we might say that uh, this forest is resilient to harvesting. And then we say, well, no, I'm going to def clearly define that system a little more. And I'm going to say, well, that's a spruce forest that's 30 years old. That system is resilient to clear cutting, but not patch cutting or a shelter wood harvesting. So you see that as we change the definitions of of what and to what, that changes what we are measuring in terms of resilience. So that might be defined as a forest, a spruce fir forest, a forest shrub mix, a vegetated landscape that's simply green. And if we're talking about resilience and it's still green, even though it's now something, some different species, that still may be resilient depending on the definition. And then of course the different disturbances may, um, you might see some a very different outcome depending on how it's going to be measured. And then another way that people talk about resilience is the sort of magnitude of a disturbance before it changes state, in terms of sort of crossing a threshold. And then uh, others, in my case, more of what I am talking about is the ability of a system to simply recover from a disturbance, rather than talking about a specific threshold that a system is crossing. When you say recover, you mean recover to its pre-existing state? Uh, well, talk about that. That's a good question. You'll see it in a moment. We'll get to that. Yeah, that's the that that was the that's the the first step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, these systems, lots of disturbances. Uh, timber harvesting. Oops. Timber harvesting. Windstorms. Fire. More fire. I have a background in fire, so. Um, so instead of talking about those disturbances themselves, I was interested in looking at the recovery to a pre-existing state or something like that uh, after or after that disturbance. And so then I said, okay, how the heck are we going to measure this thing called resilience? We can do it in a bunch of different ways. One way we might do it is say, okay. Let's look at the abundance. So we have the pre, we'll call it fire, we'll say pre-fire abundance. We have this much, that blue bar is, says we got this much abundance, this much biomass, we'll say. Then we have the fire, and then 50 years later, there's this much biomass. So what would we say about that system? Is it low resilience, high resilience? Mm. High resilience. So we'll say the resilience was high, great. And then uh, another system, we might say, we started with this much biomass, now we have this much biomass. Say the resilience was low, or medium, in this case, right? So we could say that, that that is one way we can define resilience. Um, and then we can calculate the change in biomass, AGB is the above ground biomass, the change in biomass that first system on the bottom, we have a change in biomass of zero after 50 years, which is very high resilience, um, et cetera. With minus 0.3, minus 0.1, low resilience, et cetera. So another way we can measure resilience, whole different system, whole different way, is we can look at the species composition. 
So year zero, pre-fire, we have these three flavors of trees or species. <laughs> then we have fire, and then we have 50 years later, and we have looks like the same exact suite of species in the same abundance, we'll say. And so the resilience of this system is high, high right, high. <laughs> Versus uh, we can look at the species composition of this other system after that fire, and we see that in the top case, we have a total flip-flop. None of the flavors of trees on the bottom have appeared in the top. So that resilience is low. So now we're talking about a whole different way that we're measuring resilience. Abundance versus species composition. And we can put a number to this looking at these various dissimilarity indices. In my case, I use the Bray Curtis Dissimilarity Index, which measures the common species including abundance between those. So, and then I can map that out over time. So here's the biomass, where we have pre-fire biomass, the fire knocks it all out, and then it slowly recovers. And in this case, it's interesting that the biomass recovers above my pre-fire biomass, right? So it, it actually recovered over the initial condition. And then I can map, uh, graph out dissimilarity over time, same sort of thing. In this case, I didn't recover back to the same zero point. In fact, it, it's never going to cross that line. Why not? Why might I never get my dissimilarity to increase, in fact, above you mean more similarity similarity. Similarity. Yeah, because you're never going to come back to the exactly the same species mix in abundance. However, biomass, if we're just looking at biomass, we can have more biomass than zero. So I was interested in these two measures of resilience, but I wanted to look at them together. I didn't want to look at them separately. So I took these two measures of abundance and I put them together in one, uh, in two different axes, uh, multiple axes. This is how that looks. So on the x-axis, I have the proportional, let's see, the proportional change in biomass. On the y-axis, we have the proportional change in dissimilarity. That's the species composition. And then we have at 0, 0, that's up in the upper right, that's the pre-fire condition. So we have, and then the fire happens. And so the immediate post-fire, that's what we change. We got, went to minus 1, minus 1. So that's that sort of first time step after the fire, or after the embers have cooled and we can measure those trees, measure that site. So we have a proportional change in biomass of minus one, and we have a proportional change in dissimilarity of minus one. And then 10 years after that fire, we've started to come back. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Doing the punchline. So 50 years post-fire, we've come back to this point. So then we might measure, again, I'm interested in a measure of resilience. We can look at the distance between this condition and where we ended up after, let's say, 50 years. Or we can look at the distance between this and any point in this line. We'll call that DIJ or DJK, I guess I call it. And we can say that resilience, an index of resilience, is one minus that distance. And so I did that in my simulations. And so I'll show you some of the results. So we have, again, on the x-axis, this proportional change in biomass, and on the y-axis, proportional change in dissimilarity. And in this case, this is uh, the resilience using simulations of fires that happened in 2005 and simulated forward for the next 50 years. So I looked at the simulation of fires in my landscapes and then under these different emission scenarios and management scenarios and looked at that uh, uh, recovery. So here's one of those scenarios. So in this case, and then again, we can measure the resilience index as the one minus the distance from the minimum point on any point on those lines. And so we started at zero. 
we started at zero, zero here, and then the pre-fire brought us to one, minus one, and then each of these, and that's all three of those scenarios made that track, right? And then each of these kind of split up. And in this case, you see that which scenario is the most resilient? High emissions. High emissions. Yeah, the high emissions scenario. So in this case, this high emissions scenario under the Minnesota business as usual management scenario, with fire starting in 2005 and feeding climate to that, the next 50 years, that we had a more resilient in uh, uh, the change in species composition as well as change in biomass under that high emissions scenario. And then of course, these go, the proportional change in biomass go beyond zero, and you see that the current climate has more biomass recovery than the high emissions. However, when you look at both biomass and dissimilarity, that uh, high emissions was the more resilient under this index. So then I looked at, um, of course, these three different management scenarios. Again, business as usual, this expanded reserve scenario, and then my climate suitable planting scenario, where I'm planting species from further south. And uh, I found that, let's see, um, well, in many cases, the current climate were, was more resilient than the high emission scenario. But the bigger story, I'm going to show you the same six graphs, so this is Minnesota versus Michigan. I'm going to show you the same six graphs with fires that happened in 2050 rather than 2005. So that fires that happened 50 years later and then simulated forward for the next 100 years. And you see kind of a different story. So now, which is the least resilient in these systems? The high emissions. Yeah, so the high emissions scenario, that's this kind of the red line. This ends up being far below the current climate and the low emissions climate scenario. What is the average like stand age in Minnesota and Michigan in 2005? I just wonder, I mean, are a lot of these forests quite early in succession that are kind of being aggregated in your model and have been harvested recently, or? It's a mix. I, I don't, I could get those data. I don't have them in front of me or in my head. But it's a mix, and the fire is happening with a stick, the fire simulation model is a stochastic process, so it's not just picking out harvested yeah. sites or, low, or early succession versus late succession mm -hmm. systems. So it's kind of all, all mixed together. Um, let's see, and it's a simple model that doesn't, the fire model does not um, burn down jackpot thickets of fuel like a more dynamic fire model might. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly stochastic in that way. Uh, so I don't know exactly. Um, let's see. Of course, the other question is, well, what about management? Was my climate suitable planting or expanded reserve scenario, was that better at getting a more resilient system? And in this case, it's a little bit hard to tell, but the climate suitable planting was a little bit, if you look at just the high emission scenario, you see that the climate suitable planting was a little bit more resilient in that those systems recovered more uh, than the business as usual and expanded reserve scenario. And I measured that resilience, that distance, minus one, and found that, although, and there are some statistical differences uh, in my, um, in that unsuitable planting scenario. So, um, I wanted to say that these systems have these, results, rather, have been put into action uh, on the ground. Uh, so it's not just these simulation results, but the Nature Conservancy, collaborating with these other outfits in Minnesota specifically, have taken these results and been planting species on the ground. And through this project, uh, they have planted 4,000 seedlings, this is last summer, uh, in this experimental design, species seed zone, forest type mix, and then 84,000 seedlings in this long-term monitoring plots. And they planted bur oak, northern red oak, white pine, and basswood in these systems. Uh, some of those species were species that I was simulating. So it's sort of exciting to think that um, this sort of adaptive management 
results is, is leading to some work on the ground. Um, that included 2,000 acres of forest service, state lands, and county lands uh, along within these commercial timber sale sites where they're interested in that site productivity. And they protected each of those seedlings from deer. I bring that up just because it's a huge investment to do this sort of planting. It's not just a matter of throwing seeds out of an airplane or something. It takes a lot of investment. So, some of my conclusions. Uh, large changes to forests in the Northeast are expected, including the Great Lakes region. Uh, that relationship between diversity and productivity may become more positive under climate change, supporting efforts to preserve biodiversity. Measuring and managing for resilience on these sort of multiple axes uh, describes a more complete story. And uh, climate change management must consider options that are even more innovative, creative, and radical. And I'll give you an example uh, in accepting new paradigms for success. So this was my measure of resilience, change in biomass, and dissimilarity to initial composition, back to your question. But a better measure of dissimilarity, a different measure of dissimilarity might be, maybe I should have said, what about dissimilarity to a climate-suitable composition? So rather than measuring on that y-axis what had been there, maybe we should be measuring what would be climate suitable. But that asks another question, which is, well, which climate suitable should we pick? A1FI high emission scenario 2050? Or now, what about, because we've got to pick some. And if that's the case, then we might have seen more of a increase in resilience if I change that y-axis. And finally, we might have picked species that were even more radical, like shortleaf pine, which doesn't grow anywhere near the Great Lakes region. But that would have certainly uh, done well under this sort of, depending on how we define that y-axis. And then finally, we might add axes to that. There's nothing that says that we might measure resilience on more than two axes. For example, we might be at sort of a soil carbon or wildlife habitat, some sort of economic value, microbial <coughs> activity, recovery of some specific indicator species. And as we add these different axes, we can still measure that recovery back to some point in space. Um, quickly, I'll just, I know I'm out of the time, I'll just talk about the future directions for me which is that I'm now working in New England uh, on this uh, LTR-funded project uh, where we are gathering stakeholders and looking at multiple scenarios across New England, including Vermont, and running uh, similar sort of future scenarios of climate change and management scenarios. We're using a slightly different version of Landis than what I did before. It's sort of more complicated, includes more biogeochemical processes. Um, we've been working with Eduardo on sort of developing a, a good map, initial condition map, um, looking at these different species. We are calibrating this with flux tower data, looking at the carbon dioxide flux in the atmosphere and sort of calibrating the model to that. And one of the possible scenarios we're looking at is sort of a bioenergy scenario. So if we increase bioenergy in New England, what's that going to look like in terms of forest change. And then another scenario we're interested in is a reduced nitrogen deposition scenario. So um, it, that we've seen the sort of decline in nitrogen deposition over the last 10 years, 20 years uh, under the Clean Air Act. And so what effect will that have on forest? So that's, those are some of the uh, future directions for us. Thank you very much. Now yeah. Can we go back to the slide that correlates productivity and resilience? Uh, productivity and abundance. That one with the uh, diversity. Diversity. The one with the yeah. sideways uh, bell curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something counterintuitive in it for me. Maybe I'm just miss missing something, but. Um, it seems like 
we usually like diversity. Um, and this one? And yeah, so wouldn't we expect, no, uh, the one with the, with the fuzzy edges, that was the... You like that one better? That one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so high emissions, increasing diversity and productivity would argue, if you like diversity and if you like productivity, it would argue that climate change is good. Well, except that uh, well, we see that climate change, and maybe I didn't talk about this. So you see climate change in these scenarios has declined the productivity. If you forget about the x-axis for a moment, you see that these dots are lower in this high emission scenario than over here. So we have a decline in productivity. So if you like productivity, well, we have a decline. Well, then why was this slope positive? Because the relationship between diversity and productivity within these site within the, these are eco regions became more positive. So there's some dependency question that's arose ar uh, under that question that that issue. Yeah, I guess I don't understand it all that well. It means that under high emissions, <coughs> diversity is important for productivity. Under low emissions, not so much. Right. Thank you. If the emissions are high, then more diverse systems remain more productive. And right. Lower diverse systems lose more productivity. Right. 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 And, uh, yeah, I assume. Yeah. yeah. And then under, let me go back. <coughs> under, um, under the current climate, the stratification of productivity is, in this case, driven by the soil water capacity. The red dots at the bottom, the blue dots are at the top, meaning the higher soils, the more productive soils are more productive. But then as we get into this high emissions climate change scenario, that begins to fall apart. What becomes important, more important in these simulations, is this diversity. Diversity becomes more of a driver to productivity. Is there a dynamic component to your soil model? In, this, in these scenarios, in the sense that, I mean, a lot of your northern forests are going to have significant soil carbon stocks that are partly built up over time due to low temperatures and, and you know, and, and basically anaerobic conditions. So I just wonder if that's being factored in as well. Yeah. Uh, somewhat yes and no. Uh, dynamic meaning that they're, they're not spatially dynamic, so a soil, this uh, soil water capacity uh, change in over 100 years. Correct. In the model. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. Because yeah. I imagine it would, but it, it would decrease overall somewhat as you lose <coughs> carbon, basically as you lose organic matter. You increase sorry. respiration yeah. with warming. Yeah. Yeah. Especially under the, the, the less carbon, less biomass being produced. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good question. Good point. I had a question on the, the additional axes that you might propose and if I remember one of them was sort of the value of the wood if if these are heavily managed lands presumably it's it's the timber companies who are really most interested in your research um, and I'm seeing a shift to hardwoods and I say well that's a good thing yeah, right right bring bring it on I'm gonna make I'm gonna make more money let's, more. let's, let's have this shift happen yeah 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 at this uh, let's see where we're yeah, that they, they look at uh, something like this, yes, and they say, yeah, that's, that's great. That's yeah, res high resilience. If if you're interested in economic value and you know that a two by four made out of or a, you know that the uh, veneer cut from this group of northern hardwoods is valued more than the spruce fir group, we have a more resilient system. If that's what you're interested in, yeah, yep. And there's definitely that's a tricky thing. Um, and I've been in a, some meetings where uh, with some of those folks, and, and they are interested in that, and they're sure. they're they're delighted. <laughs> uh, and then of course we're talking about other non timber valued systems that have to be most of this land is owned by timber companies. Um, 
this is a mix of public, these systems, right. Minnesota and Michigan, is a real mix of uh, public, state, county lands, as well as some, in Minnesota there's some industrial <laughs> forest land, in Michigan very, very little, in, in northern lower Michigan, very little industrial timber land, but a lot of private non-industrial. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Well, yeah, while you're on this picture, I had a question about the, the planting in versus the seed dispersal. And so this, when we're looking at it, it's business as usual versus high mission. So is there no in-planting of different species in this? Uh, correct. They, this, this, these graphs are showing um, the business as usual, which did not include the planting of climate suitable plantings. But what then what's the economic viability of at planting in, because I'm assuming most of the region here um, in this region is natural region. Yeah, although there is harvest, there so is some there is quite a bit of planting uh, currently uh, as part of business as usual, mm -hmm. but it's planting of the traditional species that have been being planted, including some of the, the spruce fir. Okay, because that because then if you're, if you're that, already planting, then just planting different species isn't that much more expensive. But if you don't plant then doing that at any kind of scale is, is very expensive. Very expensive. Yep, absolutely. No, you bring up a good point. And the um, and we've we got hit by the reviewers somewhat on on that issue that they're saying, well, your experimental design is unrealistic. You're planting all this stuff. You're you're not these results, but when we ran those. And I would argue that, yeah, it's unrealistic, but they're experiments. And we need to, again, back to that trade-off thing. If you don't plan enough, you're not going to see any result. So we needed to be able to you know, show a different enough scenario to be able to learn something from that. Uh, so we, we planted maybe more than uh, what was possible. Although then we look at that Nature Conservancy example where they're planting the heck out of these lands. Um, so those things are possible. So a uh, few questions. Um, so then you, these, these simulations are driven by temperature and precipitation. And so were they driven by monthly, monthly precipitation, daily? Uh, that's, that's a good question. question. Monthly, monthly, not daily. daily. Monthly. 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 And then they use like, like one, one GCM, GCM for each scenario, so do you use a set of GCMs for each of these straight lines? Or? Sure, sure. Um, what we, we chose, chose was this, this, uh, this, this combination, combination of single GCMs and single, single, single emissions. Okay. Okay. And then do you do any kind of like bias correction, correction for the for the particular region for what the GCM predicted, or did you just use the raw results? We use the downscale projections from Cathay Halo. Okay. So I guess my my point is there's there's a there's a lot of uncertainty in what actually drives um, the relationship between tree species and climate, and you know, like we're we're kind of constrained <coughs> using these uh, adjusting our P PFTs, our plant functional types, to current distributions under current climate. But but you know climate is highly multidimensional. We we know through these Holocene records that you have these these non-analog communities that emerge, which seems to indicate that we don't really have a clear understanding of what components of the climate um, trees perceive as being critical. Mm -hmm. And so then when you're, when you're driving a forest model like this, using you know, like averages at this kind of scale, that I, mean, I think it's interesting, it's very valuable, but we also have to be aware that there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, in our projections of what we, and how the system may actually respond. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, we are simulating this kind of realized niche, uh, but what's actually, there's a great deal of uncertainty about the, uh, where that realized niche will fall. And I agree with you 100%. There's a ton of uncertainty. Okay. Maybe you mentioned this, but uh, are uh, insect infestations and disease a part of this mm. as well? Yeah, uh, I didn't explicitly measure the dynamics of any particular insect, um, but I did reduce the growth of a few of them. Uh, there's a beech bark disease, which I, I sort of, a, it was a little bit of a hack to reduce the, or increase the mortality 
uh, a certain age of beach. Uh, the spruce woolly adelgid, I did something with the balsam fir to reduce it, but I didn't explicitly measure uh, insect or disease outbreaks in the model. But that's certainly an uh, area of future research, and other people are, are doing that very thing in some of these landscapes. Because when you think of resilience, you think about surprise bad news. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. The <laughs> sort of unknown unknowns. Yeah, I agree with you. So, uh, question here, then the room. So I just had a, a question, line clarification on another one of your figures. It was the one yeah. um, biomass over time showed a, in a, a logistic accumulation of biomass. Mm -hmm. This one? Um, yes. So is this, I, I, so first of all, what, what scale are these graphs? Are they? Sure. That's, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't talk about that. This is simply the total biomass sort of aggregated all together across those two different landscapes. Okay. So it's not a, uh, it, in this case, it wasn't uh, divided by a, a uh, meter squared or anything like that. That's total biomass on the landscape. Okay. And, and, and not the removed biomass by harvesting. Okay, and so you're you're assuming pretty much a constant level of regrowth and regeneration. Um, well, I'm not sure what you mean by that, uh, because there, it's not constant. It's certainly dynamic mm -hmm. in terms of the the there are lots of different processes happening, including uh, these. This, this seed dispersal, harvesting, fire, and wind, and this growth is all has have a stochastic processes that are happening across the landscape. But overall, I mean, over overall, you're you're assuming that that doesn't change over over time. Though. That the regen is constant over time. Regeneration is based partly on this establishment probability, which is is a function of the climate and soils at those different sites. And so those are dynamic, spatially and temporally dynamic. Okay. And so regeneration is very much affected by that <coughs> particular parameter, which very very voltage changes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question over here. Yeah, I'm trying to reconcile the figure you had uh, a couple slides back where you showed the community types under those two scenarios, and then your Figures where you show the proportional dissimilarity and biomass, and you kind of show it increasing and then dropping off. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I'm interested in the rate, and if you could go to those figures, the rate of that decrease in similarity between the two the scenarios, and do they vary? So, I guess is that our your is your species diversity kind of winnowing down to its climate adapted community to faster or slower. You talk about this these uh, ones? I think one more. Yeah, these. So it sort of starts to drop off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. So what's if you just think about the biomass itself, what is happening? You tell me. So is a biomass has reached, let's just look at the red line. Biomass has reached this point. Right. And then it starts to decline again. What's going on? It's increasing. No. Biomass. Well, the biomass is biomass. continuing to increase. Yeah, but your species diversity is decreasing. Or the species dissimilarity. It's not necessarily diversity, but the dissimilarity from the initial condition. What's going on there is that we've the successional properties of those sites are taking over beyond what was going on from the fire itself. Right. So in other words, we've gotten to this point and then some successional process has continued to increase the biomass beyond zero, beyond the initial condition. And the dissimilarity, well, maybe we've sort of come to a different uh, successional state and the dissimilarity has changed. And so that's why I like this idea of resilience as this minimum distance between any point on the line. Which I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think it's an important piece. Uh, which is that, so 
resilience at this point is after 50 years, but in fact, we were closer to where we came from after 30 years in that example. Right, and the difference between your final point under high emissions is a lot less than the other two. Um, and but I guess it's occurring much faster. You're kind of settling into that climax community faster in some scenarios than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That in this case, in the current climate, we've accrued more biomass faster than these other two scenarios. By the biomass just being the x-axis. So if if each of these time steps is is a is a time step, so that's all of these final dots are 50 years out in this image. Yeah. So um, to me, the most interesting thing about this talk is this clear quantitative measure of resilience, that B. Um, and that's just to say that's one of the kind of most clearly thought out, let's actually measure this uh, versions of resilience that I remember ever seeing. So that I'm just, I keep thinking about that. Um, and I wondered if you ever plotted D against time <clears throat> to get at your how fast does it come back mm. version of resilience. So you could just yeah. plot the difference between the original state and that over time and see which one kind of getting back to yours mm -hmm. is getting back there fastest. So I, the slope of D against time might be a measure of resilience. Yeah. I have, have you thought about that? I have. In fact, just a week ago, I did just that. Oh, cool. Um, okay. And I, I don't have the plots, but I, you can imagine what they look like, kind of, by staring at them. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And then the other question is, um, there's dissimilarity. I can't remember your other plots, but this one it's kind of interesting that dissimilarity is at its closest to the original state at x equals zero when the biomass is back to where it was. And then as biomass keeps going, this mm. already moves away. Is, that, is the hump of those curves always at zero? Uh, no, I don't think so. They seem like they're oh, yeah. close. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's that's the, the last one. That's the big one. The, the, um, so they seem most similar when they also get back to most to the yeah. same biomass. Right, right. I don't know yeah. what that means, but it seems like that's yeah. when recovery ends and new succession it's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought about that and asked that same question and I haven't figured out how to how to uh, yeah. sort of look at that. And back to your first point about the sort of clarity of resilience. It's a tricky thing. And I spent a bunch of time reading up on the Hollings papers on uh, anarchy and different ways to think about resilience. Um, and I I think that, and I know that this is sort of a sim simple view of it in terms of simply recovery. So some people say, well, you're not talking about resilience, you're talking about recovery or this engineered resilience thing. But I, I, I think that um, I think that's where we have to start in, in simplifying it and clearly saying, what are we measuring? Let's put a number on that thing that we're measuring. That's exactly what I was thinking about. It seems that. Um, as the forest is recovering back to its initial state, that's not necessarily where it needs to be, given that the climate is changing. So perhaps right. having different species in there is maybe, maybe it's part of the, what nature's trying to do. Yeah. So you're assuming that that's bad, but. Right, right. Yeah, we thought about, um, so again, that this change in dissimilarity from the initial condition. We thought about, well, maybe we should pick a set of initial conditions from 100 miles, 200 miles, I don't know, you know. So at what point do we pick that sort of climate suitable composition? I don't know. So, so just one second, Mike, sorry to cut you off, but since it is past one o'clock, um, if anybody needs to leave, please feel free to do so. And um, Matthew will stick around for a few questions if you guys. Okay, thank you all very much. Yeah.